So welcome to the last hour of this conference. We make a language switch because Michal Lineal is presenting um, her experiences on doing transdisciplinarity. She is a biologist, a, a computational biologist, is it right? And I, I um, learned that you are coping with changing, um, of you are um, researching on cellular strategies for coping with changing conditions. So I think that's what you do on the Israel Institute for Advanced Study too. She is since 2012, she's the director of, the, of our partner institute, let's say it's the IIAS, and she has really a big experience in doing transdisciplinarity. When we were in Jerusalem this, week, this year, we heard about a really good lab and a, a really working thinking lab, and the floor is yours. So uh, you challenged me in the last two days, I mean, uh, with this <laughs> language. So I decided that uh, no matter what, I'm not going even to think that I'm going to repeat something that you, uh, you discussed the last uh, two, day, two days. So uh, I decided to do something a little bit different, which will be more like, um, as, as said, a, an experience based on transdisciplinarity, or T, as I'll call it. And uh, I called, uh, uh, and uh, within this, I'll try to do three things. One is really to introduce you a little bit to the doing of uh, our institute because I think without really planning it, it has uh, quite a lot of experience, as mentioned, in this transdisciplinarity or, uh, let's say, out-of-the-box kind of uh, uh, doing. And uh, that will be the, the first part. Uh, the, the second will be something uh, about my thought about how we can learn from evolution. I realized that uh, there are not that many uh, scientists, I mean, biology, biology uh, or, or you know, other hard, hardcore natural scientists. So I'll say something about it without too much. And the, in the last part, I'll try to uh, introduce something that uh, uh, touch upon the importance of educating uh, the, 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 the young generation to think in a, some kind of a joint languages that will help this happen in a much a fluently and much smoother uh, dialogue that can be uh, built upon this. So uh, uh, let's get started. So uh, uh, I'll, 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 the, the, the title that I gave was a T-junction, because I think that we are in a, some kind of a corner, uh, uh, and some lesson from evolution. And um, because I didn't know what... Uh, really is the focus of this uh, uh, discussion, so I read what you have wrote, wrote, uh, uh, written about it, and I said, okay, uh, the first question or the first paragraph that you discussed was what are the conditions and tools and methods, if any, for, for this uh, 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 fruit, to, to have a fruitful tea co uh, cooperation? And I said, well, I can tell something about this, about the condition and the atmosphere that can produce it, and then, in the end, there was what should be avoided or what should be done in order to not to be trapped in a wrong direction and so on. And I said, okay, I have something to say about this. And uh, so, so this is the, the main two, focus, or, or two focuses the, or, of my talk. So let's start, as I said, with a, a, a quote that I really like, uh, which says that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And actually, it's a very strong statement. Uh, uh, and whenever, even in my own science, whenever I'm kind of stuck and I'm looking for a solution, I said, I'm sure that somewhere there is something to learn from evolution so I can use in my own, let's say, even experimental design, you know, as, as simple as that. And as I said, uh, I divided the talk to three parts, and we'll start with the first one, which is really the lesson from the IIAS itself. Okay. So... A brief about what, what we are and what we are doing. Uh, I think for, no, not, not that much for telling you who, who we are, but rather uh, uh, extract what makes the unique part that I think is important to this discussion on the T cooperation or T. So, in general, we are really focused on a collaborative research groups 
This is the core activity of, the, of the, uh, our institute. In addition, we have quite a lot of advanced school. We have six in a year. Advanced school means really uh, uh, for po postdoc, uh, young PI level, I mean this level. Uh, if I have time, I'll tell you more about it because it's pretty fascinating. And then we have these events, conferences, workshop, and so on. Many of them are really to plant new ideas, so not that much like a big conference rooms, but rather than like a think tank, more, more than, you know. And, and uh, we have other, other events that I won't uh, discuss too much about. So let, let's focus on the research group, because I think by, by the definition of research group, we are already deep into, into this uh, uh, kind of discussion. So... So we, the, our groups are really uh, 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 comes and initiated by open call. I mean, people comes with ideas, and we are getting this idea often. Um, I'm, I'm even proud to, to say that a lot of the uh, proposal that have been rejected, a year later they say, thank you for rejecting us, because it's initiated such a great already uh, uh, initiative that some of them were funded by the EU, some of them were developed into some other kind of activity. So I'm not that proud about it, but uh, of rejecting uh, a proposal. But I think the process of preparing such a proposal that will be collaborative by itself has its own uh, benefit. So, so that's something to say that uh, 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 for the open call, for the, you know, why is it important in my view? But anyway... Once this is, I, I'll skip all the procedure, it's not that important, but, but each research group is composed in the end of eight core people that are staying for the entire, let's say, year, and additional of four to five to a few visiting, long-term visiting scholars, and together it's a pretty intense group of 10 to 12 scholars, at least half of them from abroad, I mean, outside of Israel, and in any case, just to make it simple, we don't allow a research group to come from the same institute, too many, I mean, maximum, maximum of two, to, to make sure that they, it's not become a department seminar, and, but something else. So that's a little bit of... Uh, and, and the research group, as I said, this is the entire uh, uh, protocols, how you build a group. It's just three line. It must be f mostly from abroad. Visiting scholars should be added. And no more than two from the same institute. All the rest is, is, is easy. Okay. But of course, uh, um, we only know how it starts, but we have very little understanding where it's going to develop. And as I already mentioned, sometimes it's surprisingly developing in directions that we didn't even expect. So that, that's what I'll try to touch. The other things that I think it's, um, at least for us, is, is, is one of the mission is not only working within the group, but uh, to allow conditions, let's say, that will uh, stimulate inter-groups uh, connection. And I think most of the exciting stuff are happening in those arrows, actually, not within the group. I think it was mentioned, at least in the part that I could understand, it was mentioned earlier, uh, which I think it's very important comment, that sometimes the tension and the trust, the, the word was used a couple of times, uh, within the group is much harder than between the groups. Somehow it's far away, so people are more open and more collaborative uh, di dialogue is happening between fields rather than within fields. So somehow what seems to be the hardest, I think it's the easiest. You know, in the counterintuitive maybe. Okay, so that, that, that's an important component. Uh, the next uh, uh, things that uh, uh, should be mentioned is this uh, 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 multidisciplinarity. And, you know, we already talked about many of those names. I'm not going to repeat it. Maybe there are many terms, too many definitions. The definitions are not important. I think you mentioned that uh, uh, it, it has to be in a relaxed form. I mean... Everyone maybe have a different definition, but we understand that it's not really a formal definition, but rather a continuum of, uh, uh, of a, a, a cross borders and so on. So if you take all of them, it doesn't matter exactly at what level, it's all about creating something new by crossing borders or by acknowledging the borders, let's say at least, 
and thinking across them. So, so I think that's a better definition to, and then you can pick whatever li line you like out of this list or any creative list that you can uh, come with. So I, I think really the idea is really to understand that we are trying to do, I mean, in transdisciplinarity, we, we try to recognize that there are borders, but try to cross them to do something new. That, that's, for me, is, is the key. I mean, so, you know, this is, uh, as I'm a graphical person, rather than a uh, uh, textual uh, text, I, I just put it in, in kind of graphical, very intuitive kind of uh, uh, illustration that I think was discussed probably in the last two days about this, but I think without too many words, you can see that when you talk about discipline, uh, it's, it's separated with a big space in between, like islands in an ocean, you know, each, of, each is an island, has its own ecology, its own culture, its own wording, its own text, its own, and so on. Of course, the, the second line it tells us something about building bridges, about uh, at least having bridges without interfering the island. So the island will stay, I mean, you don't have to worry about it too much, but at least you do from time to time. And I think most of what we see is this level. I mean, okay, a, a talk or a conference or a meeting or a gathering in which two islands are talking and go back to their place, nothing happened. I mean, it was nice. Sometimes it was very fulfilling, but really the, the impact is, it might be not sustainable. The, the, the third line is maybe the, the most uh, tricky one and the most um, challenging one in which you you, as a scientist, as a scholar, are willing to broaden your view, which by itself become to be overlap with another set of scholars that doesn't have to talk the same, doesn't have to think the same, but at least you have a common uh, base, and this overlap of this uh, vein, the, uh, you know, the diagram is, is, is what uh, makes, I think, this important. Uh, and and the, the, the last one is my, maybe something that it doesn't even have to be a goal or some mission in which it's melted into some understanding. And often, again, I'm not criticizing, but maybe that's not even something to wish, that, that we would like to wish, uh, uh, in order not to destroy the, 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 the uniqueness and the power and the methodologies, uh, strength of each. So, so again, we, we can discuss it, le le I mean, in some other times, but um, le let's say... I'll give you an example, as I promised, and we'll go from there. So just a few examples from uh, uh, T groups, I'll call them, in the last two years. Or, uh, so, so, for example, we had a group, I'm just saying it because I think it illustrates what I'm talking, about computability, what can be computed and what cannot be computed. So for this specific group, we had philosophers, we had a... a uh, Computer scientist, I mean, really a top line computer scientist. We have, we had uh, uh, filmmakers about history of art or history of face science, sorry, and, and so on. And all this combination uh, 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 made something quite, quite unique. I would say, maybe just as an illustration, that uh, um, there was a, probably some of you are aware there is a, a Ada Lovelace, uh, uh, this specific very special woman. Uh, had just a birthday of 200 years. She was also the daughter of uh, Lord Byron, uh, the poet. And so, so she, and she is considered the first programmer, the first one. That, I mean, a, a, again, debate, but, but a, a very important point in history of this computability. And a series was announced. And in this series, of, uh, uh, um, the, the, this group invited 12 scholars from all over the world to argue about this and to debate about it. And this series became to be something that uh, uh, will end up in a book about the tension between what's computability, what's computer, and what's really calculators and so on. So all these issues of where are we heading, including the future of computability. So that, this is one, one good example. I'll be brief on the others. Uh, health and environment, very, very interesting to rebuild a new framework of thinking in ecology in which stress is part of it. So, so it, uh, very, uh, again, and, and 
uh, uh, now we are going to have uh, in a couple of months a group on the complexity of the immune system as a system that on one hand can learn, like the brain, has this adaptability. On the other hand, we do not really understand its limits. So a complexity science. So, so this is really an example that, as you can see, two of them are on the border of science and one of them are on the border of really, I mean, everything. Okay. So this is just a list. Uh, I, I'm not sure maybe there are too much light, but you, you can see that uh, I marked some of those interdisciplinarity in some kind of a mark saying that about a quarter or a third of our list are having a natural uh, uh, interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity aspect, just a, as a, okay. And I, uh, okay. So as I said, in this uh, uh, project, uh, this illustration is mainly to remind me, as I said, that it's not easy always. So it's a reminder for me that it's not easy. And some people, some scholars feel really lost almost dying, you know, almost lost it. So uh, just because the bridge always is tricky uh, 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 place in which it's not safe always to be there, but it brings you to a new, new island, let's say. So this is just an illustration. Again, uh, 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 to show that um, it's really going on for many years, just from 2013, uh, uh, a day to the public in which biology meets psychology. And that was about developmental child. What happened in the first year of a child from many different perspectives. So it's, it was psychologist, sociologist, biologist, geneticist, parents, you know, and meet together, try to, 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 to try to understand whether you know, this plasticity is, is as a window, whether it's open always, whether there must be some rules or not. Uh, so, so this type of discussion was really half of the audience were biologists, hardcore biologists that doesn't like all this psychology business, and other are psychologists saying, what is all this genes story? I mean, forget it. And this led to quite interesting uh, 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 debate, and I would say tension. And I think what we are good at is building tension. Maybe the Middle East is... Is another part of it, but, but let's put it aside. I'm just saying that uh, uh, we are trying to, to, to move from the comfort zone. It's maybe an uneasy task, but I think it's worth it. That, that's my point. Okay, so, let, let, uh, okay, so the take-home message, connections count. I mean, you cannot just be... So, so as you can see, uh, we had this meeting about or this event, outreach uh, uh, event on connections, on social capital, but, but it counts. So, uh, what, what else? Uh, um, we had also maybe one example that I can show you that it, you know, often the question asks, okay, so you build a dialogue, very nice. Can it mature into something that is fundamental? And it's very hard to answer this. Usually, you cannot really trace and put your finger saying, okay, this was before and that was because it's a continuum of... But one good example is, is this example of a research group that has been in the institute 35 years ago. The, the institute is already 43 years of functional, uh, I mean, functioning for a long time. And about 10 years ago, so it took 25 years, uh, that the people of this initial research group built a center. It's called the Center for the Studies of Rationality. And just to say that this, by now, it's a center and an educational program with PhD, postdoc, uh, a PI coming from economist, evolution, computer science, cognition, law, and philosophy. They are all there. And just uh, to give an, an example, uh, this is the center. Uh, maybe it's nice to say that one of them got a Nobel Prize, but that's kind of on the side. But, but this is a center, and it's by now has you know, 25 PhD students, so it, it's really mature into something that it's by itself uh, uh, can hardly, you can hardly touch. In this rationality, sometimes they like to call themselves irrationality because, you know, uh, whatever is rational, there is another side that is irrational. So those are really a combination of people, uh, mainly, by the way, econ uh, economists, uh, economists and mathematicians started this. So, okay. 
Another one, one, one example, and by that kind of I, I'll move from example to, to a more general a, a view. Uh, uh, this is a, a group that started in 2006, so again, 10 years ago, on the idea of movement ecology. And uh, uh, just to say, they established a novel interdisciplinary field of research to explore the cause, pattern, mechanism, and consequences of movement, organism movement. You know, women, uh, I mean, men and women are, are also organisms, but mainly they focused on birds, and uh, uh, they really did a, a groundbreaking uh, integrative research on the movement of other organisms, and the outcome is quite, in t uh, you know, uh, for example, a nature paper, a, a nature series, like a, a sister journal on movement ecology, and the center in Germany, Minerva Center, and so on and so forth, just to say what, what, why we know that it was influential, because 10 years later, the meeting of this initial research group came back to Israel on the, as I said, Minerva schools. I mean, they, they did a school. And uh, uh, clearly, the advanced school on, on this uh, specific uh, topic included a high-throughput tracking system that was developed because of this, including computer scientists, engineered, in order to be able to put the minimal kind of two grams or one gram of GPS on each and every bird that they catch, and now they have a complete kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, track, tracking system that is very famous in the world in which you can track the movement of, of birds trying to understand the design, the logic, the pattern, and so on. And, you know, it, n nothing here is kind of new, but uh, uh, um, what, 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 what is new is that uh, uh, and this is the take message uh, number two, is that they seek for the impossible. They say, okay, we knew how to do, you know, big birds to put a 10 gram on their back and everything. Was, but can we do it for a bird that is only, you know, I don't know, 200 gram? Can, can we do it? Or 100 gram? So, so they said, okay, let's see. And they end up talking to engineers. Can you do a minimal, you know, GPS that will... And, and it worked. So, so it's really just to push the border as well. Okay. And uh, 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 so, so the IAS provide an environment, an atmosphere that encourage and stimulate this T dialogue, that, the in, in initiative. That's my point on this part. Okay. Uh, can we critically uh, evaluate the impact? As I said, it's hard especially the short term is very hard. The long term, sometimes it's easier, but definitely you know, innovative ideas are important. And also, I think it was mentioned at least in the first day, the legitimation of this is also very important. Okay. Uh, uh, last example from the, from the uh, Institute is a, a conference or a meeting or a gathering on ancient DNA that was done, you know, it's a very important topic. There are a lot of action uh, 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 those days, and it was run by two people from the Hebrew universities uh, with a lot of uh, 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 excellent people throughout the world. And I I'll tell you what was this dialogue. I like this example maybe because I was talking to them and I said, tell me something that is really amazing. I said, okay, to amaze you, it's not that easy, but we'll try. And this is the story, and the story goes like this. Uh, 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 one of the organizers at 2007, uh, um, oh, I, I'll, I'll go back uh, one minute. Um, as you may know, there are a lot of text, old text, 2,000 years text, in the Dead Sea Scroll that was, were found, and many of them are fragmented to thousands and thousands of bits and pieces. Now, if you, if you uh, I, I guess some of you are aware, because this topic of uh, uh, digitization was uh, a very interesting uh, uh, project of Google in which they try by doing uh, um, image processing and geometry fitting to build the puzzle, which is a very nice and important project. You know, using computer to build the pieces into a, a, a full page. And of course, in the end of this project, there are still thousands of fragments that are not connected to anything and are very hard to interpret and to read and so on. So the idea was, you know, it, started, it sounds like a start of a joke. When a, a, a veterinary geneticist, historian, and text expert are meeting, 
in a bar, let's say, but it doesn't go into the joke, but actually they meet, and they, they came with the following idea. The idea was to take advantage of these new technologies of DNA genetics that is so effective and so uh, 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 powerful to those fragments. What does it mean? Uh, the idea is to take, this is the Dead Sea, and this is where the scroll were found, and to take the bits and pieces, and each of these fragments one can touch with a needle, really without the, uh, causing any harm, throw it into the machine and do the sequencing. What sequencing? Now remember, many of those scrolls are made of goat skin. Goat skin is a biological uh, uh, material. If it's biological material, it has a DNA. If it has a DNA, we can trace the goat. If we trace the goat, we can find those goats that are the same goats in different fragments. And now you can plug them in. Isn't it amazing? So, so the, 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 the veterinar that knows everything about the goat genetics and the text people that knows what's written and try to, and the historian that understand how they pulled a skin of a goat to make a, a, a page, and how many pages out of one goat, and so on, all combine in order to be able to do this matching in a fantastic and you know out of the box thinking. And this is something that is part of this dialogue that cannot be done unless you bring them together, uh, uh, those experts. So this is a, a, a something that I really like, and. And other things that we do in, in, in our institute is uh, th there are, like in, I think, many countries, there are like uh, uh, centers that are built sometimes for a topic. In this case, it was quantum informatics. Big, big topics in informatics, in physics, in computers, in, in many aspects. And they, they, the center, we invite them to, to use us as a, as a platform because we are good at initiating all this dialogue, and, and it's like 20 uh, uh, researchers from mathematics, physics, computer science, philosophers, chemists, and so on, met together, set for a couple of days in this Q-start, uh, uh, and the take-home message there is they try to melt the, con I mean, to, to do some melting of concept, and they, from their perspective, the more Expertise, the merrier. So really bring whatever you can to this undefined kind of uh, fuzzy definition of QStart. And just to say, the summary of the project was, and I'm almost quoting, we now know that we do not know nothing. But that was very important. They had to do undo. And doing undo is sometimes not as important as doing you know, some, some, some moving forward. So they do undo. They said, now I, we understand that we understand very little, but we understand that, that they thought we knew what we knew or in the original knowledge has to be revised. And that was the end of this conference. And uh, uh, so, so I like it because it's like going back in a sense, but going forward in many other senses. Last things are conferences. So those, are, as I mentioned in the beginning, planting ideas rather than developing them. And I'm just giving three examples. One is a talk, a, a discussion on a memory as an engine, a engine of thoughts from a historical point of view. Very interesting. The other is uh, a talk about uh, or, or a starting a discussion about big data and the current consent. What is consent today? I mean, it's over because... If you write, you, you need the consent, you don't need the consent. Anyway, anyone knows everything about you. So something in this uh, broken uh, uh, ideas of privacy and consent in view of big data, medical data, Google, Facebook, this type of... And that, that was the extremely interesting. And the other one is uh, uh, from the group of computability, uh, a computer scientist, a very famous one. He gave a talk like on moving from Aristotle to iPhone. And uh, it's, a, it's a, his idea about how, how this uh, moved. And of course, it started a, a big discussion. OK. Uh, how do I do it with time? I didn't look. Uh, 
but if it's okay, uh, uh, it's fine, it's fine. Okay, so after I think I can, op hopefully I convince you that there is a lot in this reboot and doing islands, ma matching uh, 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 disciplines and, and let the atmosphere be so that you kind of respect it. And that, that's important. I, I want to take you really for five minutes or something, or something like that through what we can learn from real evolution. And uh, I realize that there are not that many uh, evolutionists in the room, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to, to, to move and see what can we learn. So evolution is really, as I said, uh, the best uh, uh, teacher that we have. And evolution is a unidirectional, but in a sense, it's pretty random. So, so you know, you build up mutation and mistakes and variation, uh, basically randomly, just because the machine of replication of DNA is not perfect, that's all. So, uh, from time to time, you, you got mistakes. Of course, like you write a book. I mean, from time to time, you have a mistake. Now, evolution is best described, in my view at least, as a continuum of changes. So there is no one jump in evolution, but it's a continuum of accumulation of changes. And uh, uh, changes, sometimes I'm, I'm putting the words in a very soft way, changes rather than mutation, rather than variations, you know, it's in a, sm in a smooth uh, kind of discussion. And the point that I want to make, and that uh, uh, the analogy that I'm trying to do to T learning or T uh, uh, collab collaboration is that lack of changes, such as mutation, let's say you don't have them, is considered as a counter uh, power or force to selection and leading to some kind of stagnation and freezing. So to a steady state in which you do not uh, uh, anymore have the capacity to, to, to adapt. And that's a very important notion in evolution. What I mean by that is that once you have a system that is frozen, I call it frozen not because it's frozen, but it's because it's not changing, you can do a very fast rep reproduction. You can produce again and again like a copy machine, like a clonal. That's exactly the definition of clone, what I just said. So it's a copy machine of the same stuff again and again. You can do it a lot because you don't have to invest in variability, in, 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 in the, the diversity. The problem of being there is that it's perfect in a perfect world. It's perfect in an unchanged world. When everything is okay, that's the best strategy. So the fitness of the organism or the population is in this stated are optimized or is optimized to uninterrupted conditions. So whenever the conditions are fixed, it's beautiful. You can produce in this machine as much as you want. However, we are living in a changing world and evolution is needs to cope with the changing world. And there is this very important notion of evolvability, which is the capacity of the system to adapt, to, to make adaptive evolution. And uh, uh, it's the ability of a population of organism not to just generate diversity, as I mentioned, just to change, but actually to generate adaptive genetic diversity so, so that it fits better this condition rather than the other, and it's evolved, of course, there, uh, through natural uh, selection. For example, a very simple example, sexual reproduction is not a copy machine, is not a Xerox machine, it's combination. And once you start with combination, you lose your power to do endless copy. It comes with a cost. So what I, I, I want to say that sexual reproduction is a way in, in, a, in, a, in a, is a way to increase the potential of the organism and the population to co to cope with new uh, uh, situation, and that's very important. So, so this uh, short uh, lesson on evolution, I think it's important. Let me just uh, 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 show it in a very schematic way. This is one bacteria. On on purpose, I took bacteria, not you know. No. This is one bacteria that divide. So the bacteria on top and the bacteria on bottom are just the same. So they can be very fast, very effective. And uh, uh, th this is the clonal uh, uh, state. Let's say that now I'm looking at a phenotype. Phenotype means just a, a properties, let's say. 
a phenotype, and the phenotype is sensitivity to antibiotics, just as an example that all of us are familiar with. So let's call it S, because it's sensitive, sensitive okay, to antibiotics. So in those, uh, uh, in, in those uh, uh, let's say, this, what will happen is at a random case, from time to time, there will be a mutation or a change or a deletion or whatever that will cause this specific bacteria to be resistant. It happened once in a million, but it happens. Now, it's extremely non-effective, non-efficient procedure. However, let's say in a situation where antibiotic is not present, and let's say it doesn't give any advantage, so these bacteria either disappear or not, or, but it's, it's in a very, very minor uh, fraction of the population, but it's there. So in this case, let's say after 100 generations, you have from S to R, resistant now, okay? Now, in the presence of antibiotic, which is the selection in this case, the situation changing condition, right? Now we are not in this ideal world. The small variation in this population, one to a million, is sufficient to dominate the population, and that is illustrated here. This bacteria, the, the yellow one, was resistant, just one out of million. But after you put the antibiotic, all the rest dying. The only one that survive are the yellow one, and in two generations, that's what you have. Only, only yellow one, right? That's evolution. That's evolution under pressure, under selection. Okay, so, so having understand this, maybe it explains how come that the world is become, oh, most of the bacteria in the world, especially in the modern world, are resistant? Why? Because the overuse of uh, antibiotics just did what exactly I showed you in the pr pr previous slide. Exactly. So look at this number from 2000 to 2012, and this is the percentage of the fraction of the major bacteria. What's the fraction of their resistance? Amazing. And, and, and shocking, right? So why I'm telling you all this class about microbiology? I mean, you didn't come all the way to hear this. It's because of this co concept of adaptability. And adaptability is the ability to phenotypic change, like I just mentioned. Now, the key is really to be able to succeed in an unstable setting, and I'm, bring, I'm zooming into one bacteria for you. Don't worry, in a few minutes it's over. But uh, uh, this bacteria has something very special. It has its own DNA and its own information to make more bacteria, like I showed you before. But it has this blue one. And the blue one, the formal names, it doesn't matter. But the blue one carries, or carries the, the, the information for being resistant. Okay. And now I want to show you, so the phenotype of this bacteria is antibiotic resistant. It's an R for, that, for our discussion. And now I want to show you the strategy. And the strategy is to find, and now I'm at the head of the bacteria. Now I'm talking instead of the bacteria. So the creative mode of communication led to open the door for the bacteria so that the neighbors become resistant. Unbelievable. So let, let me explain what I say, I'm saying here. What I say is this one bacteria that is resistant, never mind why, now can do something that never has been done. I mean, bacteria are asexual organisms. They divide, divide, divide. And now I'm showing you some kind of a sexual uh, behavior of bacteria. What's the trick? Is that this bacteria on the left make a contact, a bridge, to a sensitive bacteria, able to replicate this blue one that is the resistance, transfer it, and now from one bacteria become two bacteria, but it's not division. It's another bacteria that gain the knowledge, gain the property, the phenotype of the other. What, what's my lesson out of all this story? I think it's quite obvious now. I just did a very not professional uh, type of explanation. Let's say this is hundreds of generations, right? So the, or the normal, the regular pathway will be what I just explained, 
changes, small changes, small changes, accumulating over many, many generations. This is like this, you know, till it gets to a resistance. However, when you have this new design in which you can bring a package of already prepared phenotype, in this case resistant, it just happened immediately. You don't have any generation. It, it can happen on the spot, as I, as I just illustrated. So there is this discrepancy of, of... And now I finish with the biology, I go to the tear research. What I just tried to explain with some kind of illustration is that creative solution can come by kind of crossing the door and opening the door to something that is already there, but comes from a completely different uh, uh, field or subfield. And this is something that uh, I, I see it all the time, that classical disciplines are bounded and evolve in a small incremental sometimes, like evolution. You know, another change, another mutation, another selection, and so on. Ideas that are refined and reshaped and so on. Adaptability is the key for the changing world. So T research in this aspect has a potential for innovation by open the door. Now, of course, there is some risk. Open the door means to, to, to swallow something that you cannot undo, that you cannot break into parts. So, so I, I'm just trying to share with you this idea of open the door, and uh, uh, I, I hope I, I can convince you on this uh, aspect. And if I may, the last few minutes, uh, to go to the third part, which is what I learned from my experience in the classroom. Uh, I, I, I teach, um, I, for the last uh, 20 years or so, I teach computational biology, which is biology and computer science. From, and I'm, you, we hope in, in the Hebrew University, a program which is pretty unique in the world, on this field. And for 20 years, we are teaching this student those two majors, which is pretty hard. And they, but then... Uh, a couple of years ago, we, I, we decided, I decided, or I thought, that we, as, as a team, we thought that the, the problem is the language, the shared language. So what I try to, to do in the couple of coming minutes is just to explain to you how we try to uh, build up a new common language. And uh, uh, I think maybe that conceptual thinking is often missing in the natural sciences, I think it's very good in humanities, but conceptual uh, thinking is not that common when you study biology, at least, as I did. And uh, scientific, scientific methodology and its strength is underappreciated, I think, by the humanities and others. So I think there is a gap, really, in, in, at least in, in the classical uh, uh, teaching system. So what we try to do is to take all those biochemistry 101, all those uh, molecular biology 101, and to build something new that I called Concept 101, thinking conceptually. And what I mean by that, uh, uh, what I mean is the objective of, of this uh, Concept 101, which is a class that is, we are having uh, uh, in Hebrew University for many years by now, is first of all to be able to build up a thinking of a quantitative thinking. This is something that is very hard. A lot of those young students, you know, in Israel, they are not that young. They are maybe 24, 20, but still young in their academic career. They are not used to quantitative thinking. The challenging is cross-discipline language. I'm sorry for the uh, mistake in English. Uh, then introduction complexity through design principle. And then a unified view of biological system and a case study. So, so this is the, the shape of the class. And the class is divided to three parts. The first is really illustration in this case, I usually I'm talking about human genome, size, unit, weight, space. I mean, really to, to go in all the definition. The second part is just to talk about concept across disciplines. And the third one is integration, to see how indeed it is used by the immune system, the nerve system, the, so how it's really uh, com coming to play a uh, place. I mean, so, so yeah, so, so let's, uh, let's move to the second part. And the second, because I'm jumping uh, directly to the end of the, to the middle of the class, this, those are the concepts that are discussed deeply using biological, physical, mathematical, humanities, psychology uh, concept. So one, we talk about communication, 
And of course, I don't have to tell you that communication between cells, you know, is exactly what's, uh, how, how the, the cell system fights a cancer cell. Because, and so, so it's a deep concept, coding, recognition, redundancy, hierarchy, scaling, modularity, memory, and so on. So all these are dealt deeply in a completely different way that are used to, 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 to study, you know, with no facts. Those, by the way, it's a class for first-year college students, on, on purpose. No, not, not after they are completely, you know, <laughs> lost their way. So coding, for example. Coding can be barcode in the supermarket, can be the DNA coding, can be this, can be... Right? So, so there are many types of coding. Uh, um, I'm just finishing up. Scaling and size, of course, is very important in computer science, in engineering, in comparing data, never mind what type of data, right? It could be human text, I mean, DNA size and information, robustness of phenomena, and so on. Uh, uh, this is on fractals, I mean, showing something about scaling in nature. This, by the way, it's a human lung, and whenever you zoom in, you'll see another lung. So the fractal of the... The, the, the shape of any subsection in the lung is just identical to the entire lung. So that's uh, some feature of the fractals. This is bacteria, how they grow, what's, what's the rule to, to build these beautiful shapes? There, there, there are rules, they are very simple, actually. Identity, how cells define themselves. So what's a password, what's an identity? And identity, of course, it's critical to stem cell, uh, biology, differentiation, privacy, password, directionality, and so on. And this is the type of uh, a, a concept that we deal with. And the last slide, just to say that I take a message is to move from bio 101 to concept 101 in order to find the, the trail, you know, the path in the forest. And by that, I would, I would like to thank you for your attention. Two things in the beginning. Uh, the first uh, remark is that um, right now I will try to do something which is saying the opposite of what I said yesterday, so <laughs> <laughs> please don't be astonished. And the other remark is um, what I want to say has to do with points four and uh, point four and point twenty eight from uh, Florian's talk. Is he still here? He's still there. Florian, point four and point 28, do you remember? It was the same. What is, what is the problem? <laughs> um, because um, what I want to do is relate um, what you, Michael, said to, to um, the way in which we define problems, find problems, first of all, the way in which we fail to solve them, and the way in which we have to reframe them and frame them and and what's, what's, what stands behind all this, and how can it be guided, and so on and so on. I think you, you gave very nice examples exactly for this question. And of course, what I said yesterday is we always have to start with a problem, and then we have to solve it. Now, I, today, I want to say the opposite. <laughs> because, um, because what I said yesterday, we have a problem, and then we, we solve it. This is only, in a certain sense, applicable to a certain class of problems which I would say are trivial. Uh, and this is the class of problems which Thomas Kuhn called the cr crossword puzzle problems. And um, if you have read Kuhn, of course, then he is much more interested in different kinds of problems and different kinds of reactions to situations. He called it paradigm changes. Um, I, I, want, I would like to <coughs> differentiate between two further classes of problems, in addition to the trivial ones. Uh, there's one class of problem uh, which are too big, not to fail, but too big to be just solved as they are. So you have to decompose them in, in small parts. An example is uh, one of the most fundamental problems in physics, so I, let me just bring in a little bit of my own, of my own background. The, um, the problem how to unify quantum theory with gravitation, a problem with the, which, is, which has 100 years or maybe 90 years of history, still unsolved, but it has been decomposed in little parts and there is success here and there. 
of course, but the, the big picture is still unclear. And the, the other class of problems which are not trivial is problems that are badly framed. What do I mean by this? Um, if a problem is badly framed, then typically what happens is um, you ask a question which pertains to this problem, and this question does not give rise to an answer, it gives rise to 10 more questions. And then you have, in the next step, you don't have answers to the 10 more questions. Each, each question of those generates 10 more questions. So the problem has no, has no contour, no, um, or no, no, no proper frame, right? And um, so I would say that many of the difficult problems in particular, if it comes to complex or complicated situations, is of that kind. Simply because uh, pro these problems, the systems that we're dealing with in complex systems theory don't have a clear defined, clearly defined boundary. So uh, there's always traffic across the boundary and that invites the additional questions to come up. Now, in that situation, uh, the, solving the problem actually includes the problem of framing the, prob the problem in the first place. So if you would, in such a situation, try to simply go the strategy of crossword puzzle solving, you, you would completely fail. No, no chance. So what you have to do is you have to spend a lot of time and energy to frame the problem properly so that you can expect that after the first 10 questions, at some point there's a kind of return uh, and more questions become answered than additionally raised. And I think um, your, your first lesson describes a lot of this kind of type of, of uh, problem framing rather than solving, uh, and that also explains why it takes so much time and effort. And also, the example from your second lesson, lesson, the example of evolution, is, I think, illustrative in the same sense when you talk about punctuated equilibrium, right? The, the steady state. The steady state um, is stable for a long time, but uh, that the state is steady does not mean that there is, that there is no pressure on the state, right? And at a certain point, the, pr the pressure becomes so big that the punctuation happens. And then you, you, you're looking for a new state. And that is, you know, so you're, you're kind of framing a problem in the equilibrium state and then uh, you break through to another solution. But the framing takes a long time. If you, if you had looked um, at this one picture that you showed, the moving picture, right? You saw when you go up to the R state, it doesn't happen like this, it happens like this, this, this. This is what we call punctuated equilibrium, exactly that situation. I'm almost done. So difficult problems are hard to frame. Framing takes time and requires freedom for exploration. Now I'm, I'm, I want to go toward the institutional side of this. Framing takes time and requires freedom for exploration. exploration. Exploration must be guided by a goal, of course. The goal is not the problem. must be guided by a goal, but must not be overly controlled. And this may lead to a well-defined problem. So the institutional side of this is, and, and I think uh, your institute, and I think our institute as well, these are exactly institutes which try to provide the space even for a long time, to get people together, fellows, in your case, in our case, also fellows, to think about things with a, with a certain goal, maybe, but without the problem already defined. And then come up with a kind of interesting problem, which is hopefully well-defined, and then go ahead from there. Thank you. First, thanks a lot for the 
interesting talk, Thank you. And which is close to my soul, in, in fact. Great. I would like, I have two questions, but well, I would like to share with you one quotation you probably don't know. It's Please. on evolution. It's by my colleague George Chaitin, in fact, and he said, evolution is an uphill random walk, uh, uh, software development in a random software space. Nice. It's, it's extremely Thank elegant, you. maybe too elegant to be enjoyed. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, yeah. Okay, but, but I have two questions. The evolution mechanism is such a beautiful mechanism, and I know there are many algorithms using uh, el the idea of evolution, but you are talking about the evolution as a system, and I would suggest that this is also very valuable to uh, simulate a system and to, with a chance to, uh, to apply it, for example, also to markets and to innovation and, and, and development of technology. Do you have any plans in that direction? Yeah, so, so um, as you say, I mean, I, I consider myself uh, kind of a evolution is a hobby of mine, I would say. Uh, I always ended up doing evolution, even that I'm trying to get away uh, so sometimes. Uh, indeed, there, there are a lot of uh, mathematical models and a lot of simulation yeah. that are done in evolution, uh, mainly in uh, population genetics and so on, really to understand the balance and the, the, the terms that you, you were using, I mean, population stability and uh, equilibrium and so on. What, what I would uh, uh, li like to say is that um, also in my, my own kind of personal uh, science, uh, I, I, I have... I always look at not even evolution, but what I call coevolution. So, uh, and this is what I try to kind of convey. Coevolution means, let's say, if we talk about uh, viruses and their hosts, right? Yes. So, there is a conflict, inherent conflict in viruses and the host. Why? Why is that? Because from the point of view of the virus, of course, infection and getting all the material of the host cell is, let's say, a goal. In terms of the host, sometimes, not always, uh, the, the idea is to try to block this invader, right? So it's not... Now, how, you, how can you do it? You would think that there is maybe one solution, but the answer is, because of evolution and its complexity, you can define... I mean, almost each case is a clever initiative of virus host, and it comes to a very creative... Solutions, different one. Why? Because of the randomization of the beginning of this process. The process just started, and it became to be refined by chance. And once it's refined, it's a beautiful solution. But you jump over, a, a, you know, generation and million years of refinement. So you can use, you, 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 you know, you can use evolution as a conceptual thinking, like I, I try to do. There are people that are doing, not in my lab and not in, even in Jerusalem, but uh, that are doing what they call in vitro evolution. So they uh, do a fast forward for evolution to try to see what are the solutions that are done. Mainly, by the way, it is used, what I call in vitro uh, evolution. Uh, we can talk it offline if needed. Uh, this is for drug design. If you take proteins and you want to build a drug, how would you know that the drug will work, let's say, for a long time or effectively, you need to understand the rule of evolution. Otherwise, in no time, the protein will change such that your drug is, forget it, it never binds, right? So by in vitro evolution, there are technological tricks to accelerate this process, and it is used effectively by drug yes, companies. Correct. Thanks. I had another question or comment. You mentioned words, for example, like to reboot, and you had a chart with memory, redundancy, and yeah. all that. And this brings me to your question for a standardized language. And I think there is one, at least partially there is one. And it's the language of computers and computer science. And in particular, what is less known, software engineering. Yeah. And therefore, yeah. with, uh, But I think this language is automatically penetrating yeah. to, to everybody who keeps the eyes open. But there, there is one trap, by the way when you use the language and the notions of, of, of computer science, that you don't have to th deal with small systems. Mm -hmm. uh, the laws uh, for small systems, for a small system, a, a software a program is a clockwork, but not for this, and this is the error of many people. Do. Yeah. 
But I suggest to use the language of computers officially, not only implicitly, yeah. but also explicitly. Thank you. I've got my own. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you a question which I did, want, did not want to put into the response. Please. You showed us in the first part of your talk, the first half an hour, uh, a number of projects that were really successful on the long run. Do you also have examples for problems which failed? For Most projects? of them. Most of so, them, yeah. okay. Of course. I would, I would say really uh, uh, that I think the success, okay, l let's define the success because this is a tricky one. Uh, if you ask whether a success is that the fellows had really completed their mission in terms of personal, let's say, career development, jumping, you know, building a, a new type of horizon for the future of science, that I would say happened in 80% of the case. But I'm not counting this as a success. Yeah. Not, not because it's not a success, because it wasn't the goal of having... That could be done by individual fellows, just give them... Or the, the success of this type that I showed are not that many. And actually, I think the institute can live very well with 25% oh, of yeah. the... And mm -hmm. I think that's about the number, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. more. Good. I mean, success that they... And, and it's a good number. I mean, I, I, I wish we can stay with this number. The rest are very, very uh, 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 highly successful for the individual, for the postdoc that have been in an amazing setting and now they are going to their own direction and they have material to think for 10 years from now. But it's not the goal of, of the, the mission mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. put. So for us, it's a failure, not because it's a failure. Yeah, I think we... But uh, I would say 25% is, is something to be proud of yeah. for any institute, by the way. I just wanted to... 20, yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I just wanted to compare numbers. I, I, think, <laughs> I, I, think, I think 20, I, I, I'll go with 20 as well. Yes, yeah. thank you. I would have a, a question to the, the background of the members of the different research groups. Yes. I got a little bit suspicious when I read that you integrate people from, I quote, related disciplines. How can you know which are the disciplines that are related? Yeah. Or the other way around, why okay. do you not integrate unrelated disciplines? Yeah. So, so, as I said, after we put it on, on um, loud and clear that most of the uh, programs, let, uh, let's say their research group, would not be you know, w one of those that open the windows to something that we haven't really thought about, but rather then a, a, a deep exploration and maybe reshaping of a question. This, the, the type of discussion that you, you, you mentioned of the importance of having the freedom to reshape and redefine a problem. So when I'm saying related or not related, first of all, I, I don't mean it's not in an hierarchical uh, order or any kind of ontology or something like that, not at all. What I mean by that, first of all, uh, uh, maybe different from your uh, institute, the research groups are self-organization. So they built by themselves by trying to find, and because it's a competitive uh, issue, they try to find the best complementarity, you know, in terms of uh, fields that will fulfill. To, so, so this is a, a, you know, in the end, there are a lot of reality, you know, the, the, this guy or this woman cannot come and so on. So, so, but, in, uh, uh, but the justification why we are, you are putting each and every one needs to be part of this proposal. And uh, uh, it happened, like in the, even in the case of computability, that the, 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 let's say the composition of the group was very nice. I mean, extremely good. However, the, you know, the committee that do the selection say it will be for nothing unless there are one or two real computer science, going back to your comment, that will challenge them day and night, not just, I mean, and so when I say related, it's not related in, the, in any sense, but complementarity that fits the question that was already shaped. Otherwise, uh, but, but I agree completely, the, the, the term related should be removed because it's not related, it's just a complementarity to the question that is on the table. For example, for the, table, for the issue of health and environment, they decided, I mean, it's uh, the, to build a, a, a group that is composed of researcher on ecology, 
that will cross the resolution. Bacteria, uh, uh, insects, you know, like till primates. So they decided the, the, the dimension, not to go into, uh, uh, you know, all, all directions, but they said, okay, it's the, the resolution level that we want to, to, to explore. So they decided to take people that will complement the type of organism that they are plant till, you know, mammals and primates. But then don't you fall into the trap that you have an idea or a concept in your mind that you know what is complementary? I mean, the, the crucial thing, the tricky thing and the paradox is yeah. only at the end of a process yeah. you have a clear or a better understanding that's, that's what true. would have been or could have been complementary. Yeah. And, I, and I, one I has agree. to deal with that. I, I mean, it's a paradox. And the, the trick is really that the initiators of the groups, you have a complete trust in their uh, common sense and understanding of the complexity of the co problem. But if it's not happened, it probably will be in the 80% that would not work. So we are perfect in time. The last possibility to catch the box. Yeah, I think I've, I've learned a new term, uh, complementiplinarity. So obviously when disciplines are complementary, um, but I'm wondering um, in the beginning about um, your even need to talk about disciplines because you said it's something about creating something new mm -hmm. by crossing borders. Mm -hmm. But couldn't you eliminate the by crossing borders because your rules basically is at least eight people and they can be from any discipline or no discipline, yeah. but it's simply about finding new things and finding ways of uh, so, creating so I'll new things. So I'll tell you because we, we got a little bit deeper to the discussion on actual organizational level, and it, it's good because uh, it's uh, very pragmatic. Some of the groups, and I would say that they sometimes belong to this small success group, have completely like a mission. We don't, we don't have a lot of them, but a mission. For example, we had a group that I didn't mention them because they do not fulfill the crossing the border and you, but they came and say, uh, not to me, it was before I came, they said, the, there is a language called Neo-Aramaic language. It's, it's uh, uh, started 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, spread throughout the world. By now, now I mean 21st century, there are islets of people that speak this language, it's called Neo-Aramaic, in Iraq, in Syria, in uh, Egypt, and apparently, I didn't know much about it, but in the 10th century, those family really got into a complete uh, 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 fight and they left each other and now they evolve in different isolated places. Now the language, evolution of language, is become, it's like an experiment in biology, you know? It's like an experiment because you didn't plan it but you just follow up the history and you have like four different groups that have a completely evolved their language and you know, you, you have a complete a, a timeline when it happened in the 10th century in a specific event. And those, this group came and said, we are going to build the first and only Neo-Aramaic dictionary that will bring back the evolution of these languages. Back. So they, they had a project. They were doing from day, from morning to night, they did a project like. It's much more related to a project like. I still think it was a very valuable and important and also, but we have both. We have also disciplinary uh, uh, and the others. So I talked about the others, but I didn't want to take those out of the game. But uh, thanks for, for the comment. Thanks, Michal. Yeah, thank you very much. So now it's time for the concluding remarks. Um, and um, there are two parts of the concluding remarks. Der erste Teil findet hier drin statt und ist ganz kurz und der zweite Teil findet draußen im Foyer nochmal statt, weil die Idee ist eigentlich am Ende einer solchen Tagung noch einmal miteinander ins Gespräch zu kommen, zu, zu vertiefen, sozusagen die für, fürs Bilanzieren, ist es vielleicht noch etwas zu früh, da muss das eine oder andere sacken, da ist es vielleicht toll, wenn auch der Band, der erscheinen wird, mit den Beiträgen dieser Tagung vorliegen wird. Also deswegen nur ganz, nur ganz kurz. Ähm, der zweitwichtigste Teil 
sozusagen des, des, dieses kurzen ersten Teiles ist, dass ich einfach ganz kurz sagen möchte, dass ich von, was ich von jedem Vortrag jenseits sozusagen der inhaltlichen Fülle und der Stoßrichtung mitgenommen habe, im einen Stichwort sozusagen, was den Tinnitus in meinem Ohr unterstützt. Ähm, bei dem Vortrag von Sabine Maaßen ist es, da bin ich sicher nicht der Einzige, der die Aussage, die ganz zum Schluss gemacht wurde, nämlich to allow um, idiocy to play a role. Ja? Also und da ist, da ist die Frage, ich habe mich schon mit um, Harald Atmansbacher darüber ausgetauscht und der hat im Prinzip eben davon den, den guten Vorschlag gemacht, ob man nicht sozusagen über die Rolle des Hofnarren, also im, im Zusammenhang mit diesem um, ein dem Idioten eine Rolle spielen, nachdenken könnte. Also des informierten Außenseiters, der gehalten ist, wirklich zu allem und jedem nach seinem Gusto gut informiert sozusagen ähm, einzugreifen. Also ob, ob das sozusagen ein Konzept sein könnte was man, oder eine Idee sein könnte, die man weiter verfolgen kann. Und bei, ich habe auch bei dir, Florian, daran gedacht, diese Außenseitergeschichte ist natürlich auch so eine, die man quasi bis zu einem gewissen Grad, Grad genau auch in diese Richtung äh, fruchtbar machen äh, kann. Bei dem, also bei dem Vortrag von Andrea Breit habe ich wunder, wunderbar mitgenommen, dieses ähm, Disziplinen als selbstverständliches gegebener Ausgangspunkt in der Diskussion in Frage zu stellen. Also das ist, glaube ich, eine, eine gute Sache, der sozusagen den Disziplinenbegriff einerseits zu schärfen und andererseits auch massiv zu schwächen. Also ich glaube, das, das nehme ich sozusagen von der, von der Diskussion mit. Wir haben ganz viel über das Trans geredet und im Prinzip haben wir ganz viel sozusagen versteckte also sozusagen Dimensionen, die, die wir in Disziplinen einschreiben. Und da ist, glaube ich, das Bewusstsein sozusagen eben von nicht disziplinären Disziplinen, das hat es, glaube ich, sehr gut geschärft. Bei der den Ausführungen von Elisabeth Bromfen habe ich vor allem den wunderbaren Hinweis auf Transdisziplinarität als subjektiven Modus sozusagen äh, mitgenommen, als subjektiven Modus, der auch noch ganz stark auf Erfahrungen beruht. Das ist ja auch so ein Wissen extrem stark gemacht. Also ich denke auch wieder eine Facette, die nicht so gängig ist in der Diskussion, wo es sich aber durchaus da, also lohnt, die entsprechend mitzunehmen. Bei David Edwards ähm, hat es mich angeregt, noch einmal sozusagen umgekehrt über diese ähm, Artists in Labs Geschichten nachzudenken. Weil im, im Prinzip ist es bei ihm, die, ein bisschen salopp gesagt, eine umgekehrte Versuchsanordnung und ich würde ganz gerne sozusagen diese, diese beiden Geschichten noch einmal auch wieder, gerade wenn es auch um Artistic Research und Research with and from Artists geht, das noch einmal ähm, mit Bedenken. Dann sind wir schon nahe bei dem dran, was uns natürlich jetzt, was wir heute gehört haben, bei Hans Greinberger ist, da geht es mir wie David Google natürlich die Auseinandersetzung mit dem Hybriden als Regelfall. Und das ist etwas, wo, wo ich auch denke, dass wir, dass wir da noch mal wirklich in die weiter darüber nachdenken können. Florian, bei dir ist es, ähm, würde ich mal sagen, das Problem als Privileg und Problem der Wissenschaften, also da würde ich gerne nochmal auch als Privileg der Wissenschaften drüber nachdenken und auch den Problembegriff in seiner Vielschichtigkeit ähm, nochmal bedenken und bei Michal komme ich auf, also nehme nehm ich natürlich sehr vieles mit, aber würde ich gerne mitnehmen, was eigentlich in allen Vorträgen und in fast allen Vorträgen ähm, eingebracht worden ist, nämlich also Crossing Borders, das klingt gut, Crossing Boundaries, es war, es war von Frontiers die Rede. Und ich denke, dass ähm, die ganzen Überlegungen, die es gibt zu Borders und Boundaries und Frontiers und so weiter, von Bart und was da alles dazugehört, dass das, glaube ich, auch eine lohnende Geschichte mal wäre, das mit Transdisziplinaritätsdiskussionen zu verbinden. Die, die Begriffe sind relativ jetzt, ähm, wie soll man denn sagen, ohne diese ganzen begriffsgeschichtlichen Hinterlegungen oder nicht, also ganz oft ohne die gebraucht und ich denke, da kann man sehr viel, sehr fruchtbar machen, wenn man, wenn man das weiterverfolgt. So, das ist sozusagen, das, das, das sind die Knochen, auf denen ich die in den nächsten Stunden rumkaue. Jetzt kommt natürlich der viel schönere Teil dieses kurzen Teiles des Wrapping Up, nämlich mich bei Ihnen allen, bei euch allen ganz herzlich zu bedanken 
für die Vorträge, für die Respondenzen, für, wie ich der Meinung bin, sehr gehaltvolle Diskussionen, für eine, eine Vielfalt von Zugängen. Es wird uns weiter beschäftigen, ich kann, kann das hier von hier oben auch ankündigen, wir werden bestimmt in zwei Jahren wieder so einen größeren Anlass machen, wo wir hoffen sozusagen, aufbauend auf dem, was heute gedacht wurde, einen Schritt vorwärts, rückwärts, seitwärts äh, gekommen zu sein. Also ich möchte mich sehr bedanken sozusagen für die sehr fruchtbaren Auseinandersetzungen mit dem Thema Transdisziplinarität und möchte mich bei den noch anwesenden Helfenden und Mitorganisierenden natürlich ganz besonders bedanken.